Hello and thank you for joining me. Welcome back to the channel in another of my interviews. Now today we're going up into the hills, into the Welsh hills in the sort of northern part of Snowdonia because I want to talk to farmer uh, Gareth Wynne-Jones. You may have seen him on the television. He's also got a YouTube channel and on social media. Hill farmer with sheep and cattle and bringing up uh, in his immersive tours lots of uh, American tourists to see what real farming is all about. But I particularly want to find out about the state of farming today because we've seen what's been happening in um, the Netherlands and of course what we're going to do if we don't have enough people to do the picking and things like that as we have traditionally done. Gareth Wynne-Jones, can I call you Gareth? Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So, oh, that's lovely. Now, um, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce exactly where you are, the name of the village or the name of the region. Could you could you give us that lovely Welsh lilt of yours? OK, so the name of the farm is Tin Llwyfan Farm. And if you translate the Llwyfan from the Welsh to the English, it literally means a stage. I so, does it? Yeah, so I was born on a stage, so it's a good start. That is a good start. I love it. Fantastic. So it's in a beautiful village called Llanbair of Echan, and it's on the Carnedau mountain range, which is part of Erri, or to you, maybe Snowdonia. There you go. And a lot of people would have walked up on sort of areas of that. Yes. Um, and of course, as you said, you have immersive tours. So tell me what an immersive tour is, because I've just been watching your one of your videos in which you've been doing all the, your sheep shearing. I'm sure you don't get all the, the uh, American tourists out there with some big razors trying to get the old wool off the sheep. So what oh, do you mean by immersive? You, you, you'd be very surprised when you <laughs> see what goes on, I'll tell you. Um, so it's an invitation for um, Americans, well, anybody really across the world to come up here um we work with um, visit wales we work with visit britain and um, we work with a lot of companies and um, we bring people onto the farm for them to have this immersive tour so this immersive tour is a little bit of a educational fun and they get a chance to run my sheepdog and that's <laughs> how it starts yeah so out of the maybe 25 to 30 Americans that come on, the the majority of our tours are quite big. Um, we do smaller ones, bespoke ones as well, you know, specialised onto the mountain. But the bigger ones just stay on the farm. I've got a big Bailey trailer that brings them up. And then we do a little talk, you know, intro, 375 years uh, my family's been on this farm. And then we talk about sustainable agriculture, seasonality. And then I pick two volunteers out of the group and then we go to the field. I bring Mad Max. Um, Mad Max is my sheepdog um, and it's the Max in Welsh, M-A-C-S. And he's, he's a heck of a dog. And people just love it because they don't get just an immersive tour and lesson in sheepdog handling because all my dogs are taught in Welsh. Uh -huh. so, they get Welsh so they get a Welsh lesson. So... <laughs> When you hear an American shouting Gorva, which is lie down, it's absolutely hilarious. I bet it is. I've got to tell you this story. One one of the Americans came, I uh, think it was pre-COVID, um, really nice guy, and he was one of the volunteers. And um, I kept saying Aradeg. Now, Aradeg means steady. Now, th this guy had some Welsh relatives somewhere down the line. So he made me spell out Aradeg on a piece of paper. He took this to the United States and got a number plate made with Aradeg. <laughs> so there's a there's a there's a big there's a big uh, Texan driving around uh, oh, Texas that is... with, with a with a Welsh saying on the on the back and the front. Yeah, which means saying steady. lie down. Yeah, no, no, steady, Aradeg, steady, steady. All yeah. oh, right, yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Brilliant. Well, that's great for the American cars driving along saying, st I guess no no other Americans have a clue what it says. No. <laughs> so it's a, it's a good talking point in a bar. What's the one thing that they come away with thinking about farming then in Wales? What do they sort of think? Wow, that was that was really the thing that surprises them. Well, you, you know me, I'm always up for a little bit of entertainment. So after every single tour, I do a video. I do a video and ask the people what will they take away from their immersive tour. And we do these maybe two or three times a week. And 
it's it's amazing. I even had one of the tour guides saying that he wanted to take my wife away last week. So <laughs> that was a bit, that was a bit of a shock. I, I, I was a bit lost for words with that one. Yeah, but, I bet. Yeah, it's it's usually about you know the Welsh language, you know our history. Um, this farm was the first axe factory in the world. Six six thousand years ago, people were working this land, taking out axe heads, stones, you know, and, and making them into these axe heads. Mm-hmm. And we have an exact replica, and I show people that. Um, we have Celtic Hill Fort just behind our house with round houses and long houses. You know, it, it's steeped in history. Um, I talk a lot about seasonality. I talk about regenerative farming. I talk about the importance of livestock. And I talk about carbon a lot, you know, because the mountains that we have and have been watching after for hundreds of years store a lot more carbon than any forestry. You know, we're, we're sitting on massive carbon banks. Um, you know, we, we need to be pre- protecting them. And them small, white, fluffy things, plus the cows, and nibbling on the grass, and every time they nibble on the grass, that grass regrows vigorously, sucking in more carbon into the ground. And and it's a circle, you know, it's a circle that I try to, you know, push and educate people because I feel frustrated that agriculture has been a scapegoat for many, many years now, mainstream media, um, a lot of these environment so called so called environmentalists, you know, blaming agriculture for everything. But I but I do say as well, you know, cheap food does come at a cost. Cheap food comes at a cost to the environment, cheap food comes at a cost to the animal, and cheap food comes at a cost to the farmer. And these are all down to government policies, and supermarkets pressing their finger or sometimes their foot on the throat of the farmer. And um, it can be very, very difficult. We have one of the highest suicide rates in any industry. So it's it's very, very scary. But, you know, I believe I do something that I really enjoy every day. And I believe, you know, my health is my wealth. I have a beautiful wife, three healthy children. And I wake up every morning with a fantastic office view. Hence, my hashtag is living the dream. But by living the dream, I need to share that. I need to be hopefully educating people about eating seasonal, mm. eating regenerative, wasting less, understanding where the food comes from, you know, making choices, going to the butcher, supporting local. All these things are relevant in everybody's life. And when we move away from this processed junk and start to eat proper food, you know, when you taste the first strawberry um, in the summer or the first new potato, it, th- there's no taste like it. These things that are force-fed with fertilizer, um, you know, out of season in some Moroccan greenhouse, they ain't gonna taste them anything. And the nutrient value will be poor. You know, and, and let's learn how to pickle and jar and smoke and go back to what we used to do. You know, I, I've got a saying, build a better Britain on our bellies with a farming food revolution. And we need to change. We need to change the way that we're eating. We need to change the way we're shopping. Um, People need to understand that they are going to need a farmer maybe once, twice or three times every day. Mm. No politician. You know, you're going to need a politician maybe once a year. You're going to need a doctor every now and again, dentist the same, accountant. But you're going to need one of us every single day or you're going to go hungry. And it does seem as if the policy coming from our authority figures is doing exactly the reverse, making farming a dirty word. I was talking to a chap called David Laity about Cornwall, and he was saying that the new thing now is this rewilding. They're going to buy up all the farms and just rewild, because apparently that's the thing that's going to save the planet, and get rid of farming altogether in Cornwall. And this seems to be a policy that they're trying to roll out across not only uh, Cornwall but and, and England or and Wales, but across the world. We've seen what they've been trying to do in the Netherlands. And it, it clearly is a ridiculous policy. The fact that anybody's agreeing with it or thinks that it's a sensible thing is beyond me. What's your take? It's absolutely bonkers. You know, and, and if we look at what 
our carbon footprint in the UK, it's one or two percent of the whole world. So if we drop it in the ocean tomorrow, it's going to make an iota of a difference. Mm. And we're not self-sufficient by a long way. We're sixty percent self-sufficient in food. So you know what do these numpties want to do? Import food from other countries that are producing it poorer, where the carbon footprint will be even bigger. You know they've got no idea. And I'm not against planting trees, but the right tree in the right place. And we could be storing a lot more carbon by planting hedges. Hedgerows are absolutely amazing. And what a lot of these people don't understand is trees don't start sequencing carbon for at least 10 years. So, you know, they're spending money on things that ain't going to make an iota of a difference for a long time. So I get frustrated, you know, that the fingers pointed at us and, you know, farmers to blame for everything. You know, we're, we're a very small piece of the carbon problem. And I really believe that. And you saying about Cornwall, while I was down there a couple of months ago, I was doing a filming project for S4C on a Bannerman project, um, which was absolutely fantastic. It was a little dairy farm down there. And these, yeah, he was a rocket science that, that used to work with uh, Richard Branson. And he decided to turn his skill set into taking um, cow poo and making it into uh, gas, methane gas. And it's amazing. So he gets a lagoon, like a slurry lagoon, where they put all the poo in. He puts like a membrane over and under it, and then it catches it. Then he's got a compressor that sucks it out. And after he sucks it out, he takes a few impurities out, and then he puts it in a gas bottle. And he there's, there's a track there now that New Holland have designed that drives, works exactly the same as a normal tractor, on methane. They then have a compressor, uh, uh, sorry, a generator that works off methane on the farm. So that farm's off grid. You know, yeah. it's produce, it's working off its own poop from the cows. You know, these there's technologies there. Yeah. You know, we, we've got amazing brains in this country, but somebody's going to have to pay for that. And, you know, consumers at this moment in time haven't got the money. So I believe that Government policy should be looking at these kind of technologies and helping agriculture and people, you know, to move away from fossil fuels because we know it's a problem. And, and you know, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend it isn't. But you know, if we want to carry on as we do, producing food in the way we do, we need something to get onto them fields, big implements. And if we can run them carbon neutral, well, I think it's a, it's a great bonus. Don't forget, I, I love a big, grumpy, greasy tractor as well. Yeah, we're red diesel, uh, to be honest with you. And we've got a few old ones here, yeah. So I don't think they'd ever turn to methane. But th there is ways and means we should be looking at. Another thing that's been very, very frustrating is the fact that some of the family farms in Wales have been bought by, well, Welsh Government have bought a couple to plant trees. And um, a few other people have multinational companies coming into Wales, buying family farms and planting trees. Now, I believe that's wrong because they are offsetting their carbon by having credits here. Mm. You know, these credits, what are they worth if they're still, um, you know, churn it out, wherever they are, if it's German, China, you know, Sweden, wherever this, you know, these people are coming from, multinational corporations and buying this land. Um, so that needs to be addressed. And we, we can work together. You know, farmers are very, very um, approachable. You know, we will work with people. But don't try and force us. You try and force a farmer into a corner, you'll make the biggest mistake of your life. I'm telling you. You've seen that happen in the Netherlands. Yes. See what happens in France. The farmers in this country at the moment, you know, are quite cool. Um, but th there is limitations to everybody. And I think, you know, when we see what's coming um, and some of the policies, we need to be sitting down and around the table and making sure that every policy works for everyone. Because otherwise, we're going to be sleepwalking into food shortages. And it's happened already. We've seen, you know, touches of it when the weather turned out in uh, southern Spain there and they couldn't get the peppers and the tomatoes here. Oh, my gosh, there was a panic. Yes. You imagine if you can't get other stuff into the supermarket shelves. We've got to be we've got to be careful because it's a very very fine line food. Mm. 
There was a saying, and I think it was Kissinger, you control the food and you'll control the people. And I think that's really relevant in what's happened out in Sri Lanka, in what's happened in the Netherlands, what's happening in Europe as well, in some parts of Europe, and what's happened in New Zealand. So let's let's be careful of what we're doing in this country. You know, let's work together. And it's very sad when you see a lot of farmland, um, and I grew up on the edge of farmland when I was young in the 60s and 70s and used to play around. I, I, I confess that I did used to dig up the turnips uh, when I was about eight of the farm that was at the back of my house, put them on a trolley and then knock on the doors of all the houses in my little road and try and sell the turnips from the farmer, which was, uh, I suppose, enterprise. They felt very, I mean, it was like tuppence, you know, pounds, shillings and pence days uh, in those. They felt sorry for me because they could have gone out and dug them up themselves had they had a mind to do it. Um, but it's sad when you see these farms being sold off to property developers because my feeling is the farmers are, and I would, I'm desperate to get land and do some growing myself. I feel farmers are very privileged to A, have the land to grow and they're custodians of this for future generations. And once you've built on it, you're basically saying that nobody can farm that land again. And that mm. seems to me... Um, a very bad decision. And I know there's housing issues, but some of that wonderful fertile farmland, and, and I used to go over there and I'd pick out the um, clay stems from clay pipes. Yeah. So I knew that was farmed in the 17th century and people would have, you know, a, a horse and plough would have had his pipe going and, and they were still being dug up and occasionally you'd get these little clay bowls with... Um, a, a, a red, not I'm supposed to say this, but a, a, a Native American red Indian with all the things and various right. sort of all those pipes and things, and it was it just gave you the history, even though it, on the face of it it was just a field of of whatever was growing, and it seems so sad that that's happening. H how do we stop that? That that the land is disappearing. I think that'll be a challenge that'll be very, very hard to stop, to be totally honest with you, because, you know, we're a growing population. I think we need to look at where we're putting houses, you know, if if we're going to expand places. Um, and, you know, if there's more money in this country. Um, we see houses going up in this area now for half a million and, you know, three quarters of a million in our little village. And, and you just look at it and you think no, none of the youngsters around here could even have an opportunity but it'll be somebody moving from down south you know selling a flat in london and and buying a blooming mansion here so this challenge is yeah and uh, i do believe that we need to develop land i'm not gonna um, move away from that but it, we meet we have to make sure it's the right land in the right place and i've been on the council for 15 years i'm, I'm a mayor of the town there's a couple of developments in this village at the moment and a couple of them are, are um, family members, you know, not that I've got any financial interest in them, but, you know, we need houses here. You know, we need affordable houses. And I think, you know, two of the sites are very good sites. And, you know, if I had the opportunity, because I have a conflict of interest, of course, I wouldn't be able to speak about it or get involved with it. But, you know, as long as it's not overdeveloping a little village like this, but I was one of... 28 in my class okay all first language Welsh speakers there's three of us left in the village right now if that tells you something um it should scare you mm. i've got three i've got three children you know and they're all first language welsh i want them you know to be able to afford the house in this village um and to be able to live in this village and to bring their children up in the same language as i did so, yeah, it, it's a challenging um, question, but I think it's looking for the right land and making sure there's enough affordable houses. Let's not just push this out for everybody, you know, willy-nilly to be able to put their half a million house and the people that we should be housing don't have that chance. So Switzerland have a, have a really good idea in how they do it and they give a certain percentage to youngsters that are local to the area. And I think maybe government should be looking at that kind of thing as well so they can have some kind of interest-free 
uh, loan over a certain a certain time. Um, there is ways and means we can do it, but at this moment in time, I worry about the youngsters. You know, I worry about where they're going to live, and you know, is our village just going to be a, a flipping retirement village for a lot of old geezers like me? <laughs> And there's a lot of those villages which, you know, were farming communities and very heavily so with their little school and the little church and then the whole community which was based around the farm. And here we are, I suppose, in the middle of June and <coughs> excuse me, harvest will be coming. And traditionally, I mean, in the old days, I'm thinking of things like in Kent where you had the hop pickers and people would come down from London back in the day and, and camp out and be part of the harvest. And, of course, in again, in olden times, the whole village would come out and help in the harvest. And in more recent times, we've had assistance from overseas visitors who've come over um, and, and done a lot of that. What's the situation now when we approach this sort of period and now that we're out of the EU, have we got a problem? I think we've had a few problems. I've been speaking with a few farmers. I was down um, on a strawberry farm a couple of weeks ago. Um, you can have a look at the, the video. It's on YouTube. Um, it's it's a new kind of idea. I've got us follow a farmer. So we go to different farms. That sounds great. I like I like that, follow a farmer. <laughs> Always, I've always got a hashtag. Um, but, you know, we went to a dairy farm as well, and it's challenging for them. It's been challenging. You know, there's nothing worse than producing something and then not being able to get it out of the ground yeah. or get it to a shop. So, for me, we need them people on the ground. We need them. And it's it's been suggested, <laughs> it, it was suggested to me by a, a friend that there is um, a community who for many different reasons now have moved perhaps from houses and they're living in vans. Some of them do YouTube videos of van life, but many are just living in there because they cannot afford because of the cost of living. They can no longer afford to rent and they're living in vans and they're making whatever or getting whatever work they can, perhaps some of them working on their laptops and remotely, that sort of thing. It was suggested that some of those people might be interested in earning some money for seasonal work. Do you think that's an option? I think it's a great idea. You know, if they can rock up in their van, get up first thing in the morning, get out to work, make a few quid, help the farmer. A couple of weeks there, a couple of months there. You know, they might even take it on as a career. Mm. Uh, but we need some kind of hub. We need to connect people, you know, van life, farming, NFU, FUW, all the unions, government, you know, we need a way to connect these people. And I think, you know, again, building a better Britain together, working um, with each other where we can't find the labour for certain times. And I think, you know, as people live in vans, and maybe, you know, it's, it's the lifestyle they've chosen because they can't afford a house. Well, it's a great opportunity that they could you know, work around the country from, you know, the south to the north, mm. they, even from milking cows to picking potatoes. You know, there's, there's there's so much different work you can have on the land. And maybe we could have some kind of way of upskilling them, teaching them how to drive tractors, you know, giving them uh, a couple of days in um, agricultural college. And, and people might, might come into the industry because we need new blood we need new people the average age i think is about 65 for farmers so we're not spring chickens so we need these you know injection of new blood and young blood and new ideas you know to drive us forward and then i think it just it just works for everybody but we have to find ways where we can put these ideas together mm. um so i've been talking to a few people that are um yeah quite influential within in the van life world <laughs> let's put it like that well i mean it and, and of course you know it sounds perhaps um a bit sort of new agey but when you think back to um again sort of old times people were traveling around with their skills to farm to farm and offering work at different times anyway that up now they're bringing their homes in their vans, however it is. I think it's a brilliant idea. And it, it sort of brings people back to the land again. 
and um, and that would be you know and, and people who are living here and they can move around and take the opportunity which it just sounds really 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 positive yeah and again you know I think people have lost connection with the countryside with the seasons with farming the food production um, 84 percent of our country live in cities mm. so you know they're not going to see the seasons they're not going to see the first swallow coming into the shed or hear the cuckoo for the first time or see the first leaves or see the first leaves falling you know all, all these things are relevant for me every single day yes. and it's part of my you know daily life since i was a little boy following my father around the fields understanding about nature wildlife food production and one of the things you know he's really drummed into us 375 years on the same farm you know it, it's it's quite a legacy but you know like you said earlier we're only custodians of this land and one of the things he kept saying to us when we were young and it, it didn't you know my father's still with us he still works seven days a week he's 87 um he's hell of a man you hard task master you well yeah well he, he's still the boss i'm still working but all oh, right excellent <laughs> but um you know he would say, leave the land in a better way than you've had it. Yeah. And I think that's, that's really important. And I think if society thought a little bit more about that, and it doesn't matter if you're farming or, you you know, if you're leaving something in a better state than you had it, that's quite a nice thing to do. Because, you know, we're here for a short time. We're just tiny little blips. You know, when I think about the people working behind this house 6,000 years ago, Digging the maxes out, you know the first, the first axe um, to chop the wood. Um, I'm sure some of the environmentalists wouldn't like that. But when I when I do my talk, I say this is the iPhone of the day. You know, yeah. um, but man, 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 and humankind, and uh, we've developed, we've developed into you know the people we are, and that that's why I get really annoyed with some people, you know, because they are giving farmers a hard time. And they've got a full belly of food, mm. you know, and and they have to realise that that food doesn't fall from the, the sky, you know. And there's a cost to producing food, and I'm not talking about you know um, money now. I'm talking about a cost emotionally, physically, mentally. You know, it's it's not an easy job. Sometimes we we have to be challenged by the elements, by the weather by governments, by supermarkets. You know, it's been a tough time. Last year was very dry. This year's very dry. Um, nothing's easy, but it's it's a great feeling when you adapt to that situation and you start to look for ideas. And, and that's what I've done. You know, I've I've looked at how my forefathers far, farmed up here and I've sought ideas and stole ideas from them. Um, one of them ideas, and you, you'll have a bit of laugh at this one because... It was all to do with wine. Yeah. Wine, um, yeah. Up in uh, up in, uh, in Snowdonia in Wales, yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's a bit crazy. So um, I go out and do a little bit of after-dinner speaking and I'm invited to do presentations. Anyway, yeah, the Countryside Alliance asked me to go and present an award to Gwynllan Conway, which is a vineyard in Conway. It's a small vineyard, very, very niche. Very, very, very good wine, especially the red, the Rondo, my favourite. Anyway, I shouldn't be pitching, selling stuff, should I? But um, off we went with our award. And then oh, they're great people. They're really, really lovely people. I've known them years. And, um, yeah, we presented the award. And after the award, Colin, um, who was the owner, took us round and just showed us the vineyards, only three and a half acres, and some of the problems he was having, you know, because he couldn't get tractors up and mowing and things. So he was using a lot of sprays, you know, weed killers, insecticides, this and that. So I just said to him, um, I think everybody must have thought I'd had too many wines by this time. He says, why don't you try some wool, you know? And he went, wool? And I said, yeah, for the last eight years, I've been putting wool on my vegetable plot as a type of mulch. So. During the winter, it will keep the frost off. During the summer, when it's dry, it keeps the moisture in the ground. Slugs and snails don't like to travel on it. And it stops the weeds from growing. And because I was only getting 20 pence a fleece, 
I thought uh, I might as well use it and utilize it. And that was it. And Colin said, that sounds like a great idea. Bring me some wool. Next day, two bags of wool, 100 fleeces. Off I went in the Land Rover, pulled up to the Gwynllan, threw the wool out. Colin comes out, big box of wine. I'm like, oh, I didn't want, I couldn't, I couldn't get the wine into the Land Rover quick enough and <laughs> get out of there because I didn't want to tell him I was getting 20 pence of fleece for it. Yeah. Uh, that was probably the best deal I've ever had in my life. Probably 150 or 200 pounds worth of wine. And um, yeah, and it was amazing. But there's always a but. And then, yeah, so that was during COVID. And 12 months later, Colin goes to test his um, grapes. So each line of vines, he will take a snip, take a snip of one, and they send them away. I'm beginning to learn about wine. So the higher the sugar content or the sugar blocks, the better the wine. So the majority of his lines were like three, 3.5. But the two where he put the wool was seven and seven and a half. So big, big differences. And he was very excited about this. And we didn't think not even the clever farmer had thought of this. So if you go away skiing, you know, um, on a holiday, you will come back with a really good suntan. It's because the reflection right. of the sun, off the snow onto yeah. your face. And this is exactly what was happening to the grape. So it was bouncing off and going under it. So again, you know, it was giving a higher sugar content and a better grape and a better wine. So happy days all around. So the week after he phoned me, he ordered 3,000 fleeces. He's the first vineyard in the world to be all under wool. That, That's, that, is that, amazing. <clears throat> that is amazing. Because I, we've heard the story that wool is in this country no longer, uh, you know, w- almost not worth cutting. Obviously, you have to. But And yeah. and, and it's, I mean, I sort of studied a little bit of history and, and the wool was, you know, the staple, the staple towns and all of that and, and how important wool was. And it made so many merchants so very rich and and wool from, from this country from Great Britain was um, absolutely the best in the world and people were, were were going after it. And then you hear that it was, farmers were just throwing it away because they couldn't... Burning it, burying it, yeah. throwing it the cattle. Um, and, and it sounds like you stumbled across a whole new market. The vineyards across the world will be crying out for this now. Well, you laugh because I've been on a Zoom meeting with um, Davis University in California and they're really keen to pick up on it. Fantastic. So this, you could be looking at the richest Richard Branson of all here now in front of you. <laughs> but that is, I mean, that is amazing, and that is a terrific story. And, I, you know, fingers crossed that all does come off. And if other farmers who have sheep and, and you know, can get some value back, that yeah. would be amazing. Um, yeah, so every fleece we take out of the market it will add value to the fleeces that are in it. So, you know, hopefully vineyards and maybe, you know, some fruit farms as well or mm. anybody really, because there's a lot of people now that are growing their own. And I think wool can be a big, big help if you're learning how to do a no dig process and, you know, you haven't got the machinery. So you can lay wool, lay manure, and you can just have a fantastic cover there instead of using plastic or cardboard or anything. And it does biodegrade, and it's it's a carbon catchment because that sheep is eating grass all the year round. Yes. Was grass, she produces the wool, and we take the wool off. So it's a cycle, you know. It's a it's a carbon catchment. So you know you you're ticking a lot of boxes. Uh, and it's like the old traditional farming where you you kept everything within the farm. You know, the muck was put back, and and all of that, and the fertilizer was. It's that whole sort of circular farming, which is fantastic. Regenerative. Regenerative, you know, I was down down doing some filming uh, this week down in Somerset, down to Earth. Um, fantastic project on it, absolutely brilliant. Have a look on my YouTube and you'll, you can watch the two videos. There's some innovation in agriculture at the moment. It's, it just blows your mind. And this is what we need to be doing, getting out there to the general public so they can understand that farmers are part of the solution, not mm. the problem. Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely, and, and I've, it's never 
I cannot understand that mentality that farmers are part of the problem. It's, it is a, a complete myth that's been missold. And um, I, it really uh, it annoys me when I hear all this nonsense. Um, well, there's some environmentalists that have made a lot of money selling books on the backs of farmers, you know. So, um, yeah, which is which is frustrating, especially, you know, a lot of... Look, we're not perfect by a long way, and there's things we need to clean up and change in our industry as well. I'm not pretending that we're, you know, fantastic at everything. But like I said in the beginning, cheap food comes at a cost. Yeah. And we, we need to address that. But by working together, we can do it. And the blame game is never going to happen. You know, it shouldn't be happening. And for farmers to be scapegoats, I really think it's totally wrong. You know, I, I'm, 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 I'm getting blamed for the climate problems. And I, I'm taking my ewe lambs onto the heft in April. And there's 30 or 40 jumbo jets flying over my head every hour to the United States. You know, and I think... Is it sheep fats or is it is is it the aeroplanes above my head? And I'm, I'm not blaming people for flying, but I'm just trying to put it into context, you yeah. know, uh, so people can understand, um, you know, we're, we're definitely not the problem. And you mentioned earlier there that a lot of people are now um, beginning to grow their own and there's a lot of initiatives now, I think, as people start to realise that supermarket foods, the highly processed stuff, and and even some of the um, the vegetables on display, which has been kept in fridges for ages, and and some of them are being coated now in a new product to make them look fresh for even weeks and weeks, so that you can have supposedly stuff from around the world, which is out of season a lot of the time at any time, and people are beginning to grow stuff, and there's lots of. Um, and I've spoken to some of them who are doing the regenerative farming, the no-dig farming, they're buying bits of land with others, collectives and things. And it seems to me a very a good idea. I think a lot of them, are, probably when they start out, don't realise how difficult and how hard it is going to be to learn everything, but so rewarding to get your hands in the soil and actually make a difference. What's your opinion on, on these sort of initiatives? Oh, it's great. It's absolutely fantastic. We've got a place local to us. I've uh, been there a few times filming Moiler Key. Um, and they bought it as a collective. I've got some shares in it as well. So everybody bought shares into it. And then they rent out allotments on a big big scale. And they've got a farm, little farm shop there and a little cafe. And, you know, when things are in season and there's lots of it, people can bring it into the shop. People shop at you know, chop and change. They've got a few pigs. They've got a few sheep. Um, it's great. You know, we should be having incentives like that, and people should have the opportunity for more allotments. Mm. We we should have government not buying land to plant trees, but buying land for people to plant food. It would make a lot more sense. And getting kids yeah. back in fields, getting kids back on farm, educating children to understand where the food comes from, how to cook it in season. You know, it's a lot healthier. It's a lot better for them. And it'd be a no-brainer because you would be investing in the future. Look at the obesity problem we've got in this country. Look at the diabetes problems, the health problems. And a lot of people don't talk about the mental health problems in our youngsters. And I truly believe it's to do with a lot of the food intake so much chemicals and um, all kinds of rubbish in this food it, it's messing with their brains their hormones and things things aren't right you know take it back to basics you know eat natural you know if it hasn't got if it's in a bag or anything else leave it where it is get it out of the ground you know hunt shoot fish and not everybody can do that but you know we had mackerel that my son caught last night he caught 40 mackerel last night. 40? Yeah, and we've got it filleted to them. You know, I, I shoot a lot in the winter, pheasants, bring them home. And they put them, you know, we have our own pigs, we have our own sheep. I grow the majority of the veg. We had new potatoes, we had radish, we had salad. Everything came from the farm, everything. Mm. You know, we had friends here on Saturday night with a barbecue. Our steak, our new potatoes, everything near enough was our own, well, I do tell a fib. She 
put some chickpea salad stuff in in there as well. So I could I haven't grown them yet, but everything else. But do you see what I'm going yeah, with? I, I, absolutely. And the other thing that you said you, with with having people round, it's that community. The you know, it's not you just growing your own thing and then sitting there, Billy No Mates, on your own. It's having friends round and sharing that food at the same time, which is so life enhancing. Yeah, and you know what? That's what farmers do. Farmers' jobs is to produce food and to feed people. And I'll tell you something, it's a fantastic feeling. I had Jack Whitehall and his dad in his kitchen. Oh, did you? Tales, um, uh, tales from my father. So he came to do this with Netflix. And it was during COVID and they, they spent the day here and I gave them a, an immersive tour. Lovely family, fantastic guys. And they sat there and they ate my Welsh lamb. And I will tell you, he said that's the best lamb he'd ever eaten. And as a farmer, I have to say, that's a good feeling. Mm. That's a good feeling. It's a nice feeling, you know, that you feel appreciated. And when I have my friends over, they go, I've never tasted potatoes like that. I've never had a steak like that, you know? And it's because they really are tasting real food. Yeah. Sounds crazy. You know, you can go into restaurants. I won't be throwing any kind of uh, herbs and spices onto my lamb because my lamb has eaten all the rarest flora and fauna <laughs> you're going to ever think of. And, you know, from bilberries to heather, and you just taste it. It's sweet. You don't need spices in it. No. And, 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 and that's what I'm trying to portray to people. That's what I'm trying to you know, get people to support agriculture, to support farmers, find a farmer, follow a farmer, buy off a farmer, you know, take that power away from the supermarket, put it back in the local economy again, circulate that again around the people that you're working with, from the taxi driver to the pub, to the bakery, to the butcher, you know, Mm. to the dance class, whatever it is, judo, you know, you're spending that money within the area. It's so, so important. You, you're just talking my language so much there. So some of the stuff I've been spouting yeah. out on the channel. How representative are you as a I, farmer I, in, in the my industry? Wife, my wife shouted something. Give oh. me two seconds. Yeah, yeah, of course. You can. Sorry. No, that's all right. Um, that, as my audience will know, I mean, this has just been absolutely fantastic because... Um, it, to hear other people say what I intrinsically deeply believe is is just um, wonderful. But to hear the people actually who do it instead of just somebody me who who who, who dreams of doing it and wants to do it is um, is incredible. <laughs> so, yeah, so there you are, you're back now. Um, so how representative are you? Do you think um, as a farmer, all those beliefs and all those core values, which it seems to me resonate I, I mean i don't know whether it's because there's 375 years on your farm and i've read some of these old farming books from the 1930s before the second world war you know villages that uh, didn't have electricity and would take water from the well and things like that and and they had that community and they had that locality and they had all that and i've immersed myself in those sort of books and then when i walk i'm in sussex and i walk on the south downs and you see swathes of um, spring barley and monoculture and no hedgerows and, and all of that. And you think, I, I just wonder how representative your views are is across the whole farming community today. I, th- I think we've got a few problems, um, to be honest with you. Everything's in the east, as in the crops, and then the livestock's all in the west. Um, how do we address that? I think we need to look back at what our forefathers did. But you've got to remember, this has been driven by the geography. This has been driven by government policy. This has been driven by supermarkets pushing, um, you know, prices on on, on as, a, as, a, as a farming community, as an industry. So it's not easy. It's not easy. A lot of these farms will be put in some land away, you know, for wildflowers. They'll be planting some things for uh, trees, hedgerows. But again, you know, I'll go back to the right tree in the right place, hedges and edges. We have to look at the way we're producing food. We have to waste less. 
Mm. And I still believe that we we are importing too much food in this country. We can we can grow our own, but we have to do it, you know, sensibly. We've got some great new technology, you know, aquaponics, solar, wind. We can use all these processes to help in food production. And I think you know, fish could be a big part of it as well. You know, my fa- my brother had a big fish farm, um, and he's retired now. He, he he sold it up, but you know that that really went well. So there's there's a lot of ways we can do it, but we have to engage with the public as well. I think the public need to understand that some of the things that have been pushed onto farmers were pushed onto farmers by government. You know, in the nineteen seventies, rip out the hedges. You know, get the plough in, more yield. You know, yeah. yeah, yield's good. Don't get me wrong, but how we produce that yield? And there's some great regenerative farmers out there now. You know, and we we're looking at some farms that need to be put back to livestock. Need pigs. Need you know they need that organic matter back in the ground because without the soil we've got nothing. Yeah. We need that soil to be healthy, and then you know we can move forward. But yeah, it's an East West thing. So um I, I, I don't know how to balance that. Um if we could take some sheep down to to your end of the woods and um get a few quid out of that. Um and then, you know, maybe they could maybe swap some corn or something. I don't know. I don't know. There's this we have to we have to look for ways that we can address some of the problems and it won't be easy. Mm. You you talk so sensibly gareth and um it's so refreshing to hear i, I mean I, as i was just saying whilst you disappeared i was saying you know i, I talk about this in the show but i'm not doing it and, and i'd love to be doing it i've just not had the opportunity to have the land and, and the money and, and stuff and and i've been reading about it and i'm very passionate about it. you're doing it and you're saying the things that uh, i i totally believe in and it's so interesting at this particular moment that people are are thinking about moving away from supermarkets and not having that highly pre- uh, processed food, which is damaging their health. And I totally get it. And um, I, I read a book by Graham Harvey, who used to uh, advise the BBC's Radio 4 programme, The Archers. And I think in the 1970s or early 80s, he wrote a book called We Want Real Food. And he introduced through that book... Uh, to me, the fact that the, and back then that the supermarkets weren't really our friends in terms of that and and the policies that have happened. Um, and now I buy food from the farm shop. Um, I, I don't want to go to the supermarkets. I want to support the independent companies everywhere and yeah. um, bring back that sense of pride, of, of people being... Um, you know looking after their animals their stock their land and the stuff that they build it i think it's so important and and the other thing is you mentioned there the children getting children to understand what food is what real food is where it comes from and the fact that they could have a go yeah yeah and and the pleasure you know the pleasure because i know some schools are doing it but but not enough and if you could get kids back in roaming free and and all of that, it it would be magic. Well, I think they could make an educational choice. Then they go on a dairy farm, they go on a piggery. You know, they come and see a beef and sheep. They see sheep being shorn. It just gives them a choice because you know we hear so much about these different diets: um, vegetarian, vegan, pescatarian, flexitarian, carnivore. You know, the, there's just so many different choices out there. Um, I, I went carnivore for uh, a month. It was a bet with my son. It was just uh, eating eggs and beef. Uh, it was absolutely awesome. I, I lost a stone and a half. Look at them guns. Look at that, hey, hey. Wow. <laughs> no, I had them before, only joking. But yeah. um, when, when I'm going with this was, ah, my energy levels were great. But I've come back from that. You know, I'm, I'm eating the stuff that, you know, the lettuce I'm growing, the radish. But I am not touching any chocolate or any crisps. And I was a bit of a chocolate monster. Um, I needed energy. You know, when you work the way I work, yeah. you brain things. So I used to come home um, now. So I'm just e- eating natural yogurt with berries and nuts and oh. things. And, and do you know what? 
honestly, I'm I'm feeling a lot better as well. Yeah, and it's because sugar is addictive. Believe me, sugar is addictive, and I can see where that addiction comes from for children. You know, with not naming no names, but like Red Bull, Coca Cola, all these things. You know, they're such a market employee. They look good at everything. And, and I remember when I started to go out to do my after dinner speaking, I, I said to a bunch of, um, and it was like OAPs they were, and they were they were really lovely, and and they kept asking like crazy questions, and they asked the question about advertisement, and I said, well, you look at Coca Cola compared to milk, yeah. Coca Cola, black sugar, processed rubbish, milk, natural, wholesome, all food. And this one flies off the supermarket shelves. Premium product because the way it's been advertised. This, because farmers are producing it, it's sometimes cheaper than water. And it was two for the price of one. You see where I'm going? Yeah. They devalued that product. Supermarkets and people devalued milk. Um, and, and, and that's frustrating when you do that because that big multinational company then can make millions mm. from how they sell it. And that's where they get the uh, the revenue to produce more advertisement, to sell more goods. So it is a vicious circus, but the only people that can make the difference is the consumer and the customer and us. Yes. So if we don't shop and buy, or if we do go and buy from a supermarket, ask if that farmer's having a fair price for what he's producing. You know, don't be scared of asking the manager and say, we're... Okay, where where's this come from? Is yeah. this British? Is this local? Look at the packaging, because a lot of misleading packaging for a lot of food in, in this country. And and that gets my goal, you know, that they've got some woodcock farm in one of these big supermarkets. And there's not even such a place. It's some factory somewhere in Poland that's throwing a load of lettuce into a bag and washing it and shipping it out into this country. It should it shouldn't be happening. It mm. shouldn't be happening. And then if we can address that and people don't buy it. You know, we can make a difference. Absolutely. Gareth, it's been so lovely talking to you. Uh, I've really appreciated the time that we've had. Um, I'm going to end it here. And I I'm sure that my viewers will be very much on the same on the same level. We're all trying to find ways now to, to stay healthy, for one thing, um, and to eat local and seasonal, so important, and to support what you're doing. And what other people like you are doing, because we do realise that without farmers and people who are growing proper, real food, we're all doomed. We don't want to go down the Bill Gates synthetic burger, thank you very much, in a factory. That would that's or eating mealworms for the rest of our lives. So, uh, well done to everything. There's an, there's an opportunity for everybody on this, you know, earth to to do something to make a difference, and hopefully my follow a farmer is going to give people opportunities to see you know how food's produced and maybe for them to think about let's go and buy because this strawberry farmer i went to see he had taken away the supermarket and he was supplying local supply chains the the guy that i went to see with the milk is him fluid a good friend of mine he delivers milk three times a week to my house and he has six rounds milk rounds you know, he's producing it in glass bottles, recycled, oh. all coming through. So so these stories are out there. I want to share them. Yeah. And not just that. So you, you can share that or follow me on Gareth Wynne Jones on YouTube or any of my other social media channels. But I'm going to do a farmer dude as well. So the farmer dude is going to be shorts under a minute for kids. Little fun, little tips for kids about farming off the farmer dude. So... Hopefully, if there's any parents out there that are up to have a look, and I've just done one this afternoon about me picking, getting some eggs, collecting them, and I've got a very vicious chicken, and she likes me. And um, yeah, we're going to try and make it a little bit funny and quirky, but hopefully, children can understand chicken, egg, you know, milk, cow, and and just bring them back to basics, make it fun, make it educational, and hopefully, they will change the way that they eat and think about where the food comes from. That is brilliant. I'll put the links in the description to this video so people can check them out. 
But uh, that is that is fantastic. Farmer dude, I love it. I shall be watching. Gareth, thank you so much for talking to me. I really appreciate it. You're giving up your time. And uh, it's just been a wonderful conversation. Thank you. So yeah. there we are, ladies and gentlemen. Gareth Wynne Jones up there in Snowdonian in that wonderful. Can you just give us once more that Welsh, the Welsh name of where you are? Tin Llwyfan, Llamair Fechan, Ar y Carnedau. There we go. Uh, that's brilliant. I'll be back with uh, more guests and more monologues and things in the future, of course. But in the meantime, from Gareth and I, thank you so much for watching. Really appreciate it. Till next time. Goodbye. <laughs>